I'm not sure if you've ever been lucky enough to attend a Duke men's basketball game at Duke before. If you have, then you know clearly about what I'm about to say. It is one of the most communal expressions of hate that you will find anywhere. As Duke fans leave the arena at the end of the game, they chant in unison, go to hell, Carolina, go to hell. Even if they're playing UVA, they still exit the stadium chanting Carolina. It's their communal lament to the basketball gods that their enemy of enemies should be smoked for eternity. But here's the thing. There are no basketball gods. The Tar Heels are still on earth. Duke is doing just a chant. It's a ritual, an expression of lament. For them, it's cathartic. Communal laments are necessary forms of prayer. At least this is true for Israel. Their words are intended to be hyperbolic. Israel probably knows what they're saying won't come to pass just because they ask God to do it, but these words need to be expressed regardless. Take Psalm 14, specifically verse 2. We hear this. The Lord looks down from heaven on humankind to see if there are any who are wise who seek after God. They have all gone astray. They are all perverse. No one does good. No, not one. Not one person? Really? I mean, that's not true. But the hyperbole shows us something about Israelite plight. This is a reflection on the enemies of the world and how Israel sees nothing redeeming about them. So they lament to God, seeking help in war. It's cathartic. So I want to stop here and say, there are lament psalms, and they teach us that we can say what we need to say to God. God can take it. It's cathartic, especially when it's done communally. But just because Israel cries out to God for vengeance, it doesn't mean God will or should. Laments are not moral imperatives for God just because something is being prayed to God. So I want us to get this. At this point in studying the Psalms, every one of us comes to a fork in the road and we have to choose a side. You're going to have to decide if you can get behind the idea that there are Psalms in our Bible that are so hyperbolic, so anger and wrath laden towards other people, like groups like Babylon, that they are birthed out of a sense of loss and lack and fear from Israel. We're going to have to decide if you can live with these words never actually coming to pass. They're just words, expressions of the heart that don't go anywhere other than to a loving God who listens to our cries and holds those tears. Or we'll have to decide if these Psalms of lament are meant to be moral imperatives for God and instructions for how God is supposed to hurt our enemies. We have to choose. Do we expect God to enact our wrath? Or is this the type of prayer that's more cathartic for our own mental health? I am one who believes in the former. For me, God is not a Coke machine in which we deposit a quarter's worth of prayer and then God does whatever we asked. Lament gives us insider knowledge into the souls of God's people. And what we find is anger and hope, confusion and conflict, the same feelings that rage in all of us. The Israelites are suffering in Psalm 14 tragically, and they're expressing their pain to their God. And this gives us permission to do the same. So many of us carry grief and loss, and we don't know what to do with it. We want to cry or get angry or repress our feelings or bury ourselves into work or addictions. We choose many paths. And what we need is a proven way to share and to release those feelings to God. And this may be the most important gift that communal laments offer us. As a matter of fact, as you study them, you start to see patterns. The anger pitted in the stomach of God's people is channeled carefully, masterfully, through a rubric. Almost every one of the lament psalms follow this pattern. Invocation, 
complaint, petition, trust, praise. Take Psalm 14. It's the perfect rubric and example. First, the invocation. The psalmist cries out for God to listen. Listen to verses 1 and 2. Fools say in their heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on humankind to see if there are any who are wise, who seek after God. Then comes the complaint. Verse 3. They have all gone astray. They are all alike, perverse. There is no one who does good. No, not one. Then comes the petition. Verse 4. Have they no knowledge? All the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call on the name of upon the Lord? Then the expression of trust. Verse 5. There they shall be in great terror, for God is with the company of the righteous. Then expression of praise. Verses 6 and 7. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, Jacob will rejoice. Israel will be glad. Oh, that deliverance for Israel would come from Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, Jacob will rejoice. Israel will be glad. What we're seeing in Psalm 14 is an ancient cathartic expression of anger. And it's being offered to God in a meaningful and productive way. Israel wasn't mouthing off to God. They're offering a systematic expression that begins with petition and ends with trust. That's why I don't see these as instructions for getting God to do our dirty work. Rather, these are instructions for how to approach God when you have painful feelings that capsize your emotions. You start with acknowledging God, then you offer a complaint, then you give a petition for God to intervene, and end it with words of praise. The ancient form of prayer still works for our pain today. And we have contemporary expressions of this. One of the greatest songwriters to have ever graced this earth is the late Leonard Cohen. In his now infamous song, Hallelujah, we see it follow this lament structure beautifully. He opens with an invocation and literally sets the stage with King David from the Psalms. Now I've heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord. And then immediately Cohen goes into complaining. But you don't really care for music, do you? It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift, the baffled king composing, hallelujah. Now he even then takes a turn and gives a scriptural allusion in the second verse, and we read about Bathsheba and Delilah. Your faith was strong, but you needed proof. You saw her bathing on the roof. Her beauty and the moonlight overthrew you. She tied you to a kitchen chair, she broke your throne, she cut your hair, and from your lips she drew the hallelujah. And then we enter the petition. You say I took the name in vain. I don't even know the name. But if I did, well really, what's it to you? There's a blaze of light in every word. It doesn't matter which you heard the holy or the broken, hallelujah. Maybe there's a God above, but all I've ever learned from love was how to shoot somebody who outdrew you. And it's not a cry that you hear at night. It's somebody who's seen the light. It's a cold and it's a broken, hallelujah. And then finally, Cohen ends with, the expression of trust. I did my best. It wasn't much. I couldn't feel, so I tried to touch. I've told the truth. I didn't come to fool you. 
And even though it all went wrong, I'll stand before the Lord of song with nothing on my tongue but hallelujah. Cohen's hallelujah is both cold and broken, but also holy and real. I mean, this song is so timeless because it does for us what the lament psalms do. It draws us to God through pain, and by doing it, it leads us to hope. So why does this matter? In life, there's good and there's bad. There's darkness and light. And then there's us trapped in an endless tennis match between the two. Our life is cold and broken, but it's also real. And we need ways to express our pain to God because somewhere in the midst of it, there is a gift. And when we learn to lament, when we learn the power of admitting the cold and brokenness of life, and we're able to move to a place that says, despite our brokenness, I'll still sing hallelujah, then there lies God's gift.